The book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, book of Ephesians. Ephesians meaning permitted. And our Heavenly Father permits Paul to take us into the mystery of God in this great book. Though it is a short book, it's packed full of information. The clue to put you on track was chapter 1, verse 4, where he said, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age. And so it is that you have to take the blinders off, look at all three earth ages, the one that was, this one, and the one coming to understand the Word of God. That is the mystery of why God has placed His people through these ages to document, to secure, and to save that's uh, basically left up to the individual. In the closing chapter, we're going to complete the book today, Ephesians chapter 6. We, we find here that it begins with that you should honor your mother and father for no other reason than they brought you into the world. That's why we've got you and we, we're thankful for it because we wanted to have, God wanted you, God does love you, and, and so it is. So we're going to pick it up there with the fourth verse, if we may. In chapter 6, and we ask that word of wisdom from our Father, and verse 4 reads in chapter 6, And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, nurture and admonition of the Lord, and nurture them in that plant that gives them life, that is to say the truth. If you feed your children the truth whereby they have that coming out the gate rather than being uh, taught traditions of men most of their life and then come into the truth, it's such a blessing for them because they have that word coming out the gate, the mystery that is hidden even in this book permitted, that is to say Ephesians. Verse 5, <clears throat> servants, be obedient to them that are masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. What it is, if you're working a job and you're receiving a paycheck, earn it. I mean, get in there and produce um, and, and um, prevail at it. I, I don't care, it may be digging ditches, but dig them better than anybody else and you won't be digging ditches long. You'll be moving up, 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 and up. When you, when you, if you receive a day's pay, put out a day's work. Verse 6, not with eye service as men, please, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. In other words, earning your keep, earning what you're paid. In other words, you know, most people realize that if a person hires you to do a thing, it's to make them money. If you work hard enough that you make them money, then they like to give you a paycheck. But if you drag along and you don't make money, they're not going to be giving you a paycheck very long. They're going to find somebody else. So it is God's will that you be responsible and carry your part if you want to be successful. This is the difference in being good at what you do and messing up. 
that's just how simple it is. And, and the same as you are loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ, you be loyal to your job. Don't, don't preach on your job. You're not supposed to preach unless that's your occupation on where you sustain yourself and your family. You do your um, evangelizing away from where you um, make your earn your keep for yourself and your family, and you'll be a lot better off. Uh, verse 7 to continue. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. In other words, our Father, when you serve Him, expects you to excel. He expects you to excel, so not only do you and your profession have a good reputation, have good credibility, but in the community that credibility and that profession builds, you have a good reputation and people will listen to you. That is God's will, that is God's purpose. Verse eight, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, whether you're rich or poor, whatever you put into it, that's what you're going to get out of it. You know, uh, God, um, he, what he does, he gives you what you can take care of. If he gives you more than you can take care of, somebody's going to beat you out of it. So you've got about what God feels. I know this upsets some people when I say this, but God has allowed you about what you can take care of. Okay. Some he trusts much and some he knows, he knows um, you're going to allow somebody, the enemy probably of, of our father to beat you out of it. So with wisdom, with prevail, you prevail in serving the living God. I feel also inasmuch as we're in a chapter that's speaking of the hidden mystery of the first earth age in this one, that just as Esau, while in the mother's womb, was hated by Almighty God, as Acts chapter, as Romans chapter 9 so stipulates, as well as the first chapter of Malachi, that you are born into what you deserve. But the beauty of it is you always have the right to work yourself out of it if you're man enough, woman enough, or child enough to do it God's way, to excel, to be responsible, and to be a, a, a um, respected person in the community whereby you can um, assist others and know others. What, what you put out, that's what you're going to receive. That's just life, friend, and so it is. Let's go with the next verse, verse 9. And you masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there um, respect of persons um, with him. God doesn't respect, he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care whether you're poor, rich, or whatever. He loves you. But being a respecter of persons means he doesn't play favorites. You get what you've got coming to you. And if you don't like that, then why don't you change? You could change according to God's word and begin receiving his blessings. That makes a big difference. You cannot... Uh, expect God to reward um, unproductivity. It's just not going to happen. And you can judge your own life by analyzing, and that's where you stand. Now, from this point forward, we're going into a little deeper realm in as much as we state God is not a respecter of persons. But we're going into what Paul was permitted to release to us the fact of the end days, what will transpire, what you should be wearing, what you should be aware of, and what it is you must do to stand against the fiery darts of Satan, for he is coming. Paul has made that very clear in more places than one when it has to do with this mystery concerning the end times. We're going into the gospel armor 
And you will note, he didn't say, maybe you should put part of it on, a little piece here, a little piece there, all of it, complete. You must be prepared and you must have it all on if you're going to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Well, what are those darts? Deception, lies, accusations, they're coming when he comes as the false Messiah. And let, let's get this straight. Many might say, well, how do you know he's coming? Well, have, have you never read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Paul hastily wrote another letter to Thessalonica when people thought he was talking about maybe flying away. He said, hey, don't let the first letter deceive you, any spirit or anybody else. Our gathering back to Christ is not going to happen until after the son of perdition, that's one of Satan's names, um, brings about the falling away. That means the great apostasy, deception. <clears throat> For as it would continue on then in about the fourth verse, he's going to stand in Jerusalem, that's on Mount Zion, in the holy place, claiming to be God, claiming to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming as Antichrist. There's nothing happens before that. I want to reiterate back to verse 1 of that chapter 2 Thessalonians. There is no way you're going to gather back to Christ in any method until after the falling away, that's to say the Antichrist appears on earth setting himself up as Christ. You've got to be equipped to stand against him. It's quite simple when you know and understand. Because if you have the gospel armor on and in place, Christ is going to do the speaking through you, through the Holy Spirit anyway, but still you are battling against, not flesh and blood, but you are battling against principalities and high places. That means the supernatural, even if you would, because Satan is able to perform miracles in the sight of men. Many are going to be convinced by his miracles and so forth because they've never read this Word of God. They haven't got a clue in how precious it is that you have that understanding. Having laid that groundwork, let's get right to it then as we get into the principalities. Let's have the next verse, please. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's the only place you're going to find it. And what did that say? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Your power doesn't amount to a whole lot. His does. And when you love him and when you call upon him, he releases that power. He does it for you. That right hand of God is able to accomplish many things. Verse 11, listen carefully. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That means the deceit, the darts, anything he might throw at you. Again, I, I want to emphasize so that you don't read over it. Put on what? Put on a little piece of it here and there? No, put on the whole armor. You're going to need every piece of it if you prevail. And against, the, uh, let, me, let me just make one thing real clear. Did it say you're going to put all this armor on and fly away? No, you're going to stand. You're going to make a stand. Why? Because you're a child of God. And that's what Christians do. If you've ever read Mark 13, Matthew 24, and, and Luke 21, you know what you have to do. Piece of cake. Part of the mystery of the kingdom. Look forward to it. What a wonderful time. Even the, even the prophets wanted to live in this generation. You do. Take advantage of it. Enjoy it. Serve the living God. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, that's Satan, against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. You know, so many people misinterpret the fighting of Satan. You know, you've got uh, so many movie makers and so forth. They have the apocalypse as it's war and it's bloodshed and, and um, they've never read God's Word. Daniel is an overlay of Revelation or Revelation is an overlay of Daniel, whichever way you wish to put it. But in Daniel chapter 8, verse 22 through 25, let you know the devil doesn't come in in war. The devil doesn't come in killing people. He comes in peaceably and takes over the world by flatteries. Why? He's claiming to be Jesus. And you know something? Most of the world will believe it. Uh, whether, regardless of what their religion might be in the four corners of the world, he will fit that pattern of whatever they call Messiah, Savior. He fits it. And most of the world, if they're unlearned, will wonder after him. That's what we fight against. Not flesh and blood. Not rockets and men and soldiers and war. But against evil spirits from high places performing miracles. You know, in Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 11, where the religious beast comes forth as Antichrist, he can snap his fingers and lightning comes down from heaven. Foss, I mean, right from the sky. How impression, how, what kind of an impression is that going to make on unbelievers? They're, they're going to go bonkers over it. That's just an old saying that means they're going to accept it. They're going to think he is the king. You can rest assured they're going to follow him. That's why it's written, the whole world whores after the false Christ. It's going to happen with the exception of God's elect who are equipped, armed well with the whole gospel armor to stand against those fiery darts of the devil. They've got it made. They can cut it. Piece of cake. Because you listen to God's word, not the traditions of men. Next verse, please. Verse uh, 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Again, for emphasis, not part of it, all of it. That you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand, to make that stand, not to fly away, not to let some bunch of traditions of men mislead you, guide you down Primrose Lane, but to cause you to stand firm for Almighty God with the gospel armor on, giving you equipment where they cannot touch you. God takes care of his own. That's why you need all the armor. Let's talk about it just a little bit. Verse 14, stand therefore, make your stand, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate is what protects you from body blows to, to the breast, the chest. And that's righteousness. When you do what's right, well, what, what would you call doing what's right, brother? Put on all the armor. But what, what is the girt? That's your belt. Well, what holds your britches up then? The belt does. And what does the belt consist of, spiritually speaking? The truth. The truth's what keeps your, your britches up. When you make that stand that you're strong and you know and your breastplate bounces off anything he might send, of these little darts of deceit, of, of uh, nonsense. When you make that stand for Almighty, truth is ever, ever so very important. You have half-truths, that's what Satan deals in. When Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness, he quoted scripture, but he always tweaked it about 90 degrees right at the end to make it a lie, to deceive. He's good at it. I don't know, with all the gospel armor on, you don't have to worry about it because you're prepared. You're equipped for battle, spiritual war. Verse 15 to continue. And your feet 
shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, you have your feet prepared to march to wherever God sends you, whatever is present. You, you do it for what pers- purpose? With, for the preparation of the gospel of peace, the true peace, not this peace, 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 they cry and there is no peace. That's what the false Christ brings. But the true peace of the Lord Jesus Christ at that second tribulation when he comes and when he takes over, but you keep your feet shod and ready to bring forth that the gospel is the good news, the good news of peace. That, that peace will come. It's going to be eternal. It's well worth working for. Everything you put into it is so simple to earn such a gift from God to have peace eternally. Fantastic. Verse 16. Above all, and this is the most important thing, above all, taking the shield of faith. I don't know how is yours. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all. Now, how many is that? All. The fiery darts of the wicked. How strong is your faith? That is, that is the real thing you must know. What is that shield? It's Christ. Your faith in Christ to know he will never let you down. He will never forsake you. As long as you are obedient, as long as you follow him, I don't care what Satan wants to throw at you. You will overcome. You shall overcome. Why? Well, you're an overcomer when you have that gospel. Above all, the most important thing, faith. That's knowledge, knowing intuitively. Christ is there to protect you, to give you that power, that strength, and to um, give you that victory. It didn't say he's going to let a few glance off of you. He said all the fiery darts. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is that sword you carry? The very Word of God. You know, when, when you read the first very chapter in the great book of the Revelation, and when you come to verse 16 and 17, you find out what the sword of the Lord is. It's His tongue. It is the sword that is the Word of God, and it cuts both ways. You know, you can take the true word of God and just slice an enemy to pieces with it. I mean, take the rug right out from under him with the truth of God's word. That's why it's so important that you realize the power of the word of God. The sword of the spirit, that spirit that you believe in, that your faith strengthens, that you have certain knowledge to know that not one dart is going to come through. Now, what should that do for you? I, I want you to think about this long, and I want you to think about it hard, because I know a lot of people, I can tell by the questions that are sent in, they're just a little bit wimpish about making a stand against uh, Satan and what might happen. I, well, he kill people, will he? Not one dart can make it true. You can stand, and I mean stand for all. That is the promise of the word of, from the Word of God, the very truth itself, with this gospel armor on and in place, that your faith alone is so strong, with the right hand of God protecting you, you overcome anything that Satan might want to throw at you. So what are you concerned about? I hope nothing other than anxious to put the harness on and start plowing. I mean, with the gospel, you're shod with the real truth, and you have the breastplate on, you have the girt tied up, the word of God is with you in your mind, sealed there with all seven seals where you're ready for them to fall one after the other until the seventh falls and it's over. And God says, well done. That's what you want to be prepared for. That's what the gospel armor does for you, with you, and in you. 
how precious it is to know what is necessary. And you know something? How simple it is, so beautiful, so perfect, and yet so simple to simply believe, to know and understand, and wrap yourself in the Word of God, truth, whereby you know how to act, react, and to receive the blessings of, and power of God. Do you, do you remember, do you remember uh, what it said? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You see, when you have this on, your power is His power, His might. So again, I, I'm saying, what do, what do you worry about? Worry is a waste of time for a child of the living God. Verse 18, listen carefully. I mean, this is something very important. What is it you're supposed to do? Praying always with all prayer and supplication. That means for asking for things which you need to accomplish this. In the spirit and watching thereunto with all pre, uh, perseverance, looking forward to it, and supplication for all saints. For all saints. What, what saints now set aside ones? We're talking about God's elect. You look out for them. You take God's elect and equip them with the proper uniform. Well, what kind of uniform is that? The armor of God. You put it on them. You have it there available for them and prayerfully. If you need anything to accomplish that, hey, ask Him. Ask Him. Make, supplica make supplication for it. And, um, uh, and certainly, if He has chosen you and if you are one of God's elect, it's going to happen. And how blessed it is to prepare the saints this, that's, that saint sounds really holy, doesn't it? It means the set aside ones. That's the ones that didn't, that were chosen before the foundations of the earth, as chapter one, verse four stipulated. That mystery that Paul brings forth. Verse 19 to continue. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, that mystery of the three earth ages, the mystery that is kept so hidden from so many people of the world. Instead of bringing forth the full power, the explosive power of the living God when on and in place to overcome that enemy, not one dart can make it through when you are equipped Satan rather runs from you, wants no part of you. And therefore, uh, with that um, hand of God, how precious it is to serve him. But this mystery, do you understand why Ephesians, uh, why we would call it permitted? God permitted him to bring it to them in this particular uh, book. And this mystery is for all. Um, did you notice that Paul said that he could open his mouth boldly and to make the mystery known? He's in prison. But even in prison, he can boldly bring forth this truth. Well, how could he do that? Because God ordained it. As it is written in um, that great ninth chapter of Acts, God struck him down the, through Christ on the road to Damascus. And in the 15th and 16th verses of that chapter, he said, he is a chosen vessel to me, that's say Paul, to go to both the kings and queens of the ethnos, to Israel and to the Gentile with a three level message to be delivered, to deliver that mystery he was permitted to do that. Even though he was in prison, God accomplishes what God would have accomplished. Verse 20, for which I am ambassador in bonds. I'm an ambassador of it, but I'm in jail. 
that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It's not holding me back. With passion, I can bring forth the truth uh, and, and be an ambassador. Many might say, well, then should does this mean all prisoners are led of God? No, Paul was in prison for what? For teaching this gospel. I don't know. What are the rest in prison for? God has forgiveness well enough, but um, Paul w was afforded many things. Why? Because he was a servant of God, chosen of God, led of God. Verse 21 to continue. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Thacicus, um, Thacicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. He was probably an, an Ephesian. He probably, the word Thacicus means uh, faithful. And certainly he would say that faithfully he will minister to you. He will bring this forth, the letter that he has written to the Ephesians, showing this great mystery that he has brought forth uh, of the three earth ages and how you prevail in the final generation, that is to say the generation of the fig tree. 22, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts, that this message this mystery, the knowledge of this mystery <clears throat> should comfort your heart and bring you right into the presence of God in prayer and supplication. 23, then he says, Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 24, to complete, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity Amen. And, and so it is. Did you understand that verse, that last verse? Grace be with all them that love, that's a condition, our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. No messing around, no playing games. You can't con God. And amen means what? That's that. That's the way it is. That's permitted. That's what Ephesians means. And so it is that that mystery of putting that gospel armor on in place. Not one little dart, not one little lie from Satan can come in and destroy you. Your character and the presence of God in your life will destroy anything that comes at you. That's why the gospel armor is so precious, so important that spiritually you place that on and wear it with dignity in serving the living God boldly. Bring forth that word. You can be bold because why? Because he gives you the power to overcome and how precious it is to be a child of the living God, knowing and understanding the mystery of the revelation. All right, Book of Ephesians. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. 
If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. That's God's business. God is our judge. You do have the right to discern who you should listen to and who you should not listen to. That's a gift from God, too, discerning spirits. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need the number or the address. God knows what you're thinking. Right now, He does. Why? Because He loves you. He may not love what you're doing, but He sure loves you. Let Him know that you return that love. That's what He wants from you. Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. It is so easy, and He is so lovable that that's a cinch because He's so good to us. Let's go to His throne, Father, around the world. We come, we ask that You lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank You, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with John from Pennsylvania. How can you tell liars from truth tellers? I'm going to assume that you mean teachers of God's Word. How can you tell when someone is not being truthful and someone that is telling the truth? It's real simple. Are they teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse? Is it God's Word we're being taught or is it a bunch of traditions of malarkey? That, that's the way you can tell the difference. It's that simple. You know, any church that really wants to be blessed, and I know a lot of churches are saying, well, uh, attendance is falling off. Well, feed them. If you feed them, they will come. Uh, and and they, you, you, they will, as long as you feed them chapter by chapter and verse by verse, I know that many times in seminaries they are taught, well, just chapter by chapter and verse by verse is very boring. Then make it lively with truth. It's not boring. It's vivacious. It's God's Word. Therefore, God brings the blessing. So you can tell by listening. If churches that teach the truth don't have to worry about losing membership. They need to worry about building bigger churches. Wayne from Pennsylvania. Do you pray to Jesus Christ or to our Heavenly Father in Jesus' name? Which is correct. Thank you and God bless you and your staff. Well, He sure does and we appreciate it. You pray to Almighty God, our Father, which is in heaven, and hallowed be His name. His kingdom come, it will be done on earth just like it is in heaven because heaven's coming to earth. But you always pray to Him in Christ's name gives you credentials that you are a Christ man, that is to say, a Christian. Uh, Rick from Ohio, where is the Ark of the Covenant and how is it up in heaven? Um, is it okay to talk and pray at work? What scriptures can I use on this? Thank you. Do not, you can pray to yourself at work, but, but don't, don't try to teach at work. Again, in today's lecture, I brought that point out. You know, you are, your job is to sustain your livelihood. You are in business to do that. Now, um, if, if someone comes up to you and asks you a question specifically, then fine, you can answer that. But when uh, you are working at certain jobs, it is against regulations and everything else to to um, teach religion. Therefore, but that's not what you work. Everything has a time and a purpose. Well, what is my purpose for working? To make money to sustain your family. It is not to preach the Word of God. They do not pay you a salary to work on most jobs to teach God's Word, but to make money for the company so they can give you a check. Okay? So, um, there is no scripture that says you should teach a Bible or at, at work. You can pray anytime because you don't have to say it out loud. The Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. All you have to do is read the last two verses of Revelation chapter 11. The Ark of the Testament is there. My opinion, don't ask me to document it because I can't. It's, it's not documental, documented. But I think it went when Elijah went. 
uh, Betty from Florida, where can I find the scripture of where we will know our loved ones when we get to heaven? One of the most asked questions. I, I know you miss those that have passed on and so forth. You will see them again. That is God's promise. And you, you are even uh, instructed that you can help them if you be one of God's elect. Zadok means elect, set aside ones, upright person. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 20 through 25, Tama, uh, Tamara from Minnesota. I recently lost my son in, to a tragic accident. How do you give hope and go on? He had a wife, a three-year-old son, and a baby on the way. Well, that's, that is sad. It sure is. But no, do know one thing. We Christians work toward being with our Father, which is in heaven. And um, be of good hope and read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And I, I know that uh, he will always show you a way through and uh, know that he is with the Father and uh, life will continue on and pray that God bless this family. We will be praying with you as well. Father loves his children. Accidents do happen. Anne from Virginia, thank you for saving my life. Can you still sin after you have died and gone to the right side of the gulf? God bless you and your staff. Well, he sure does. Thank you. Um, can, and um, I'm, I'm, the word saves many lives. Bless you. You're sir, certainly welcome from our Father. Can you still sin after you have died and gone to the right side of the gulf? You know, in the millennium, you could but you wouldn't want to. You're in a spiritual body. You don't have the hang-ups that the flesh gives you. Our flesh bodies can be pretty difficult sometimes if you make it complicated, okay? But when you understand them, but in, in the, um, when you're in your spiritual body, you're, if you love the Lord, you're not going to, okay? You're not even gonna have that desire. Francis from Tennessee. I know when you pass away, the righteous will have a glorified body. What form will the unbelievers have? It says in, um, I want you to make a note of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. This corruptible must put on incorruption, whether you're good, bad, or ugly, okay, a sinner or a saint. These bodies put on incorruption, which means simply being interpreted, these flesh bodies put on the spiritual body. The flesh body goes back to dirt, and the spiritual, the incorruptible body goes back to the Father. But that has nothing to do with your mortal soul. Because if you keep reading in that 52nd verse, this mortal, which means your soul, must put on immortality. Because a lot of people with an incorruptible body, that means a spirit body, will still have a mortal soul. Do you know what the word mortal means in the Greek? Liable to die. And they're, they're certainly liable to go to hell. But naturally, well, why do they put on a spiritual body? That's the only dimension you can be judged by God in because that's the dimension our Father is in. So, but you still have a soul that's liable to die but a lot of people, hopefully, if you're one of God's elect, you not only put on an immortal body, but you put on an immortal soul. That's uh, an incorruptible body, but an immortal soul. It's going to happen. Dennis from North Carolina. Where are the souls being helped before they come through this world age? A lot of questions concerning So They're with the Father. Let, let me document that for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, when, when this clay pot breaks and you die, your flesh goes back to dirt and your spirit goes back to the Father that gave it. So naturally, if it goes back to the Father, if your spiritual body goes back to the Father that gave it, that's where you came from because He's the one that gave it, okay? We all come from our Father. Deborah from Alabama, when God said, let us make man in our image in Genesis, who was that us he was talking about? It was you, Deborah. 
look at you. You you look when um, when you were born, birthed into this flesh body, you look exactly as you did in your angelic body. Naturally, the angelic body will not grow old like our flesh bodies will, but in your youth, that's exactly how you looked then, and so you look now. He said, let us make um, man in our image, and the word is Elohim, which is God and his children. Mary from Missouri, should we start packing away food for when the Antichrist comes? Will there be a food shortage? What does the Bible say? Um, you know, um, naturally, there could be hard times uh, as far as food is concerned uh, because of the type of money that will be flowing, which is self-explanatory. We cannot worship the false one and receive any one world money, though there's going to be a lot of it. The money will be flooding everywhere, but you've got to worship him to get it. Okay, We're not going to do that. But it never hurts, even in this generation. You know, they're, uh, let's take the people up north that had an unexpected, uh, due to the great global warming theory, had an early freeze for many times, and they've been without power for several days and running into weeks now even, you know, because of global warming. We have these terrible snowstorms. Um, they needed a little bit of extra food. So I use that only to say it never hurts. Canned goods, good canned goods will keep for quite some time and, um, and then use them and replenish the stock as you go along, okay? But always have extra food in your home. It's a good idea. Velma from Georgia, I am concerned about being on medications when the Antichrist comes and that he will use this against me. What will I do? You're going to let, with the full gospel armor on, Almighty God take care of him. If he tries to use that against you, it won't do him any good, okay? God takes care of his own. You will not have to worry about that through that period of time. There will be many things that um, in, we do not war against f flesh and blood, but against principalities and high places. You see, who is on our side in high places? The highest of all, Almighty God. So, Velma, don't you worry about a thing. You rest easy. And besides, um, many medications are given on a three-month period, 90 days. If the thing's not going to last but five months, you'd be in good shape anyway. Caroline from Georgia. My mother will leave church and then use profanity around my children, and I don't think this is right. What can I do? Uh, please help. Well, it's, tell her to stop. You know, I mean, it's you. There are your children, and if she goes to church, she should know better than that. I might, I might uh, give a little clue that maybe what would work is have one of your children ask her what that means. When she uses profanity, say, Grandma, what does that mean? And have them to ask that three or four times when she uses that. And, you know, it, it will shame her, most likely. I, <laughs> when a grandmother leaves church and uses profanity, I don't know what kind of church she's attending. Her preacher is, well, anyway. Have one, of the, have one of the children ask her, Granny, what does that mean? And it will probably shame her out of it, hopefully, prayerfully. Uh, otherwise, then just ask her, say, uh, you, you don't want that kind of language around your children. And she'll, she, she should respect that. Bruce from California, can you please clarify 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, did Jesus become sin? Jesus did not become sin. Jesus died for our sins. Christ never sinned. That's why he was a perfect sacrifice without blemish for one and all times. But he paid for, Bruce, he paid for your sins. 
so they could be forgiven, washed, white as snow. And so it is. No, he never, never became sin. He died for our sins. Uh, De Dennis from, Denise from Mississippi. Pastor Murray, thanks to God you are continuing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I have a question about food laws. I have a friend who is always asking me why I don't eat pork, shellfish, and so forth. They state that if I am refraining from eating them for biblical reasons, I should be keeping all of the Levitical laws pertaining to food as well, such as the verses they talk about, the vessels of pots and ovens and so forth being unclean just as the animals. He states that all of these are ceremonial laws with which Christians should uh, have no part of. Well, you know, it isn't a matter of pots and pans at your tummy. If you start eating scavengers, they will make you sick. Has the human body changed since um, the time of the Levitical priesthood when it came into being where God gave the food laws in Leviticus 11? No, bodies haven't changed. And through Christ himself teaching in the great book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, don't let anyone judge you in marriage. That means whether you're a divorcee or what. And don't let anybody judge you in what you eat when you partake of that that Christ, that God created to be received. Well, what did God create to be received? Clean animals. Okay. Now, uh, really, now stop and think a moment. If you don't have pork are scavengers in your house, then you don't have to worry about cleaning your pots and pans the Levitical way because they were never exposed to scavengers in the first place. Um, you know, if you want to be healthy, eat God's way. If they want to be unhealthy, hey, let them go. Uh, Andrea from Texas. Pastor Murray, my name is Andrea. I'm 13. Uh, I wanted to know if Satan was not condemned to hell, what would the world be like? Well, if he had never sinned and no one else had ever sinned, we would have continued in that beautiful, wonderful first earth age. But Andrea, God wanted people to have free will to love him because that's the only true love there is. You cannot create a bunch of people that can only do one thing is love you without free will and have it to be the real genuine article. It would be fake. So therefore, he had to give them free will to either love or not love him. And therefore, uh, Satan fell. And, um, and we have the... But the, it wasn't only Satan. We can't blame it all on him. A third of God's children, and there were there several there were several billion of them in His creation, worship Satan. They fell away from God, so it wasn't only Satan. He had a third of His children. And the other two thirds, there were a lot of them besides God's elect that they didn't care. The same as they do today, just give me a job and give me a fishing rod or give me some. Something I can do and just stay out of my life and let me go and I'll be happy. You know, they don't care. But they will, don't worry. So we have to have a Savior. And that Savior was our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the question. Uh, Catherine from Oklahoma. Does God judge our troops who fight for freedom when they have to kill or to be killed? Is this murder in God's eyes? Absolutely unequivocally, not, never, no, no, no. God expects uh, our people to protect our nation that gives us the freedom to teach God's word and to live in peace without terror of um, some people strapping on explosives on a child and then having them to be blowing each other up to blow a bunch of innocent people up. Um, God expects us to stop such things as that. He expects us to be able to live in peace. 
your documentation for the soldier's prayer is Psalms 144, where it stipulates right there, God give me the strength that my arms to war to protect the children and the people. I, I know that many, many men and women in this nation have uh, carry scars for having defended this nation, this proud nation of under God. And um, so, uh, and it's well worth and it's an honorable thing to do. Murder is fognance in the Greek. It means to lie in wait, criminal homicide. Defending a nation is not criminal homicide. Pastor Murray, I wanted to thank, I wanted to take this time to thank you for your service in the Lord. You're welcome. God bless you and your staff, what you do. Satan has never bothered me as much as he has until I started studying with you. That is in itself confirms I'm on the right track. Well, bless you. Believe me, Pastor, I know how to get him off my back in Jesus' name. Go for it. This letter is for you, but if you feel like to read it on the air, please do. Just know that I love you in Christ. I'm praying for all of you, and you have my support. Well, Linda, thank you, and God bless you. From And we appreciate that. And yours was in the stack. It was read, and God bless you. We appreciate the comment. Randy from California, what is the two churches that are teaching the true gospel? Well, in the true gospel being taught by those two churches was Smyrna and Philadelphia. It is not the name of the church. The, it is the content. It is what is being taught there. If you are attending a church that does not teach you who the Kenites are, that claim to be of our brother Judah and are of the synagogue of Satan, you're in a heap of hurt. You're in, you're in trouble. Those two are the only two churches Christ found uh, peace in, and you'll find it in Revelation 2.10 and 3.10. I'm out of time. Love you because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Know what? It makes His day. When you study His Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that He has sent to you, when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer.